Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Bonnie Rose. It's great to see you here today. Let us stand up and sing together our congregational song, which is uh, This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. And we breathe deeply, centering into that beautiful, divine, universal presence that is love, that is grace, that is harmony, that is the absolute reality of omnipresent goodness. And we rest there, we abide there, as we allow it to expand our hearts and our souls, expand our listening ears as we listen to the words of our sacred reading. Kissing the Ugly Frog <laughs> from Don't Worry, Be Grumpy by Ajan Brahm. The story of an ugly frog begging a princess to kiss him and turn him into a prince is one of the oldest fairy tales around. But what is its meaning? There are many ugly frogs in modern life. Your mother-in-law may be one of them. If you rearrange the letters in mother-in-law, it spells Hitler woman. So how can you kiss such an ugly frog as the stereotypical, we must say, mother-in-law. A young Buddhist wife could not get along with her husband's mom, even though she tried. No matter what the daughter-in-law said or did, it was never, ever good enough. The mother-in-law would always find fault with her. It was driving the young wife crazy. The daughter-in-law tried meditating, that didn't work. Then she tried spreading loving kindness to her mother-in-law every morning and evening. That didn't work either. Next, she tried Buddhist chanting, but to no avail. The mother-in-law was just as critical as ever. Being a Mahayana Buddhist, the young wife would often pray to the goddess of mercy, Kuan Yin. So early one morning, she tried praying. She must have been exhausted from all her worry about her mother-in-law because she fell asleep while praying and dreamed of Kuan Yin. There was the goddess of mercy in her white flowing robes holding the vessel of kindness. But when she looked at Kuan Yin's face, she was shocked. The face was not the usual one as is seen in all the statues of Kuan Yin in the temple. Instead, Kuan Yin had the face of her mother-in-law. It was a sign. And from that time on, the young wife regarded her difficult mother-in-law as an embodiment of the goddess of mercy. With such a fundamental change in her attitude towards her mother-in-law, she received less negativity. The mother-in-law began to like her daughter-in-law and they soon became the best of friends. How you regard others will be how others regard you. That is how to kiss an ugly frog and remove the wicked spell. And so it is. And so how we regard others is how they will regard us. So as we go deeper into our meditation, let's remember that we are the presence of love, that we are the I am presence that is all things, all beings everywhere. And if we're bold, if we're courageous, we can also extend that I am blessedness to someone that is challenging for us. Seeing the face of Kuan Yin, the Buddha, Jesus, any divine being, perfect love, perfect light. As we sing together for all of us, I am remembering who I am.
I can have you to dinner. Doesn't mean I should take you to bed. Just because there is space in here doesn't mean you should live in my head. I can tell you my story or proclaim my power instead. I'm shutting up the should haves. I made a list of my lesser qualities and fed it to the shredder because I know better than to water the weeds. I'm shutting down the bad press, the headlines that would steal the spark from my eyes. And darling, I'm delighted to say you're uninvited and show you the door. I am infinitely creative and the center of my universe. I can't hope to love anyone if I don't truly love myself first. So ups a daisy, here you go. I'm giving you the old heave ho, better the devil that you know. We're looking for a stone to throw. I'm shutting up the should haves. I made a to my lesser qualities and fed it to the shredder because I know better than to water the weeds. My power is within me, enough to light this city and all of its stars. And here you come to douse the flames that my dreams contain. But I know what you are. If I met you on the street, I'd say, God, what a negative person. I do not want her to be my friend. I do not want her to join my inner circle. And yet, here you are in my shower. Here you are in the bathroom mirror. Here you are at my table, on my pillow, in my workplace. Here you are, here you are, here you are, here you are. I'm shutting up the should haves. I made a list of my lesser qualities and fed it to the shredder because I know better than to water the weeds. I'm shutting down the bad press. I know my faults can speak fairly well for themselves. I don't need ventilation for my limitation, because I'm here to argue for my power. I will argue for my power. I will argue. I have to say, Margaret scared me when she said it was kind of a song that was a little, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, Margaret, Margaret can go kind of wild. Talk about Margaret Unchained, and then Chris Unchained, the two of them Unchained. Just crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, so that was great. Thank you so much. And it fits so well with what we're talking about today, because my, my message this morning is about creating a culture of encouragement. Um, I'm curious, how many of you have ever been to the dog shaming website? Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh, it's so awesome. So what happens is that dogs do naughty things, right? And then their, their owners put a, a sign around them that says what they've done, and they take a picture of it, and they post it on the website. <laughs> so you'll go on there, and you'll see this dog sitting by a dog-shaped hole in the wall. It says, I prefer eating walls to kibble. And that's his <laughs> sign, right? <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> that um, was a dog sitting next to this bedraggled stuffed animal, this Yoda, and this, the Yoda didn't look very, very pristine or happy, and the dog sign said, Pete on Yoda, I did. <laughs> 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 I 
My favorite is one of a husky. Jen and Bill have a husky. You have to tell me if this is true, if this is what huskies do, but he's lying on the ground and his mouth is open and he's smiling from ear to ear and you can tell that he's howling. And the sign around the husky says, it is 2 a.m., let me sing you the song of my people. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that I, I love that website so much is that it, it seems like such a metaphor for all of us. It's exactly what Margaret was singing about, how we invite this, this presence to sit in our, in our, at our table, and then it, we find out that it's in the shower with us, and it's in the bed with us, and it's, it's, it's at our workplace, and it's everywhere. It's as if we are walking around leading with our headline, our headline instead of our heartline, the top stories of what we think is wrong with us. And that's not very encouraging, is it? Because this talk this morning is about encouragement. So one of the first things to do is to make our headlines, our dog signs that we carry around with us, to make those visible to us. Now, probably everybody has one. If this was a class, I'd have you say it to somebody next to you, what it is, but eh, let's not do that today. <laughs> What I'm going to do instead is, is I'm going to invite Jennifer to come up here, and Jennifer and I are going to act out this thing that we learned at a seminar that we, were, that we took together in Utah. Yeah, use the mic. Yeah, we want to hear what's wrong with you, Jen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was a, a seminar that we did with um, two, two uh, there you go, to uh, one practitioner and one minister. And what they had us do was to approach each other and, and say our, um, the, the thing that we are um, sort of leading with, the thing that, that, that rattles in our head all of the time, that story, that negative story about ourselves. So I might go up to Jennifer and say, Hi, Jennifer, I'm Bonnie, and I have no sermon today. <laughs> That's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then she does it to me. Hi, I'm Jennifer, and my backyard looks like the Clampets live in my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> and just like that, so you can, we're done. Thank you, Jennifer. But we'll, we'll do something else more later on, okay? So stay down front. So, so one thing that's really powerful to do is to make that story visible. In the seminar, people were saying things like, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I have not completed my bestseller yet that I said would be done by uh, two years ago. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm still afraid to, to try skiing. You know, just all of the things that we, that we carry around with us. You know, the, the one about having no sermon, usually it's, it's more like, oh my God, I have no sermon to write, I have nothing to say, I've said it all already, all the other ministers have taken the ideas, Reverend Mark LaPont stole them all from me. You know, so it goes, it goes on and on. And, and we just get those out in the open so that we can see them, so that we can see them, so that we can address them. Ernest Holmes said that, there is no evil, that evil is not a power unto itself, and that is actually one of the most misunderstood things in the science of mind teaching. It's also one of the things that I think is probably the most important thing in the science of mind teaching, is the belief in one power versus two powers. When we are creating a culture of encouragement, we are reinforcing the belief in one power. Every time we tell one of those stories about the belief in two powers, that's a, that story about I have no sermon or my backyard looks like the Clampets live there or I haven't finished my book yet, that is reinforcing another, an, a second power. It is as if we say, something out here has the power to ruin my life. Something out here has the power to make me feel badly about myself. Something right there has the power to distress me. And the truth is, is that what is out there is actually in here. And we can, we can do the work to cultivate, to first of all, let it rise up so that we can see it and then choose anew to create that culture of encouragement. So instead of saying discouraging words to ourselves, we can say encouraging words to ourselves. And when we say encouraging words to ourselves, that is a belief in one power. See, the thing about two powers is that we have brains that are steeped in duality, in a du dual consciousness. So we think that there is good and evil. We think that darkness and light are equally powerful. We think that there is joy and sorrow, when really they are all part of a continuum of greater wholeness. You know, the thing about dark and light, I think this is the easiest one to explain, also life and death, but I'll go with dark and light. With dark and light, you know that darkness is actually a principle of absence and not presence. Right? Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light, just as sorrow is the absence of joy, just as discouragement is the absence of encouragement. Right? And that makes it easier to manage if we think of it in that way. Because light, 
joy, love, harmony, beauty, law, all of these are truth. All of these are characteristics of the universe. All of these are absolute. They, the substance of life is made up of love and light and beauty. The substance of life is made up of all of those things. And so when we acknowledge that there is only one power that is all of the good that we have just said, then we align ourselves with that power and with that life, as opposed to believing in another power outside of ourselves that has the power to hurt us. One of the reasons I know that light is a superior power to darkness, light is the truth, is I learned this from Brock Travis's late wife, who I never even met, but she talked about how when you have a room, two rooms beside, beside each other, one, there's a door separating the rooms, right? And one room has the lights on, and the other room is dark. When you open up the door, does the darkness spill into the light? No. It's the other way around. The light spills into the darkness. The light can conquer the darkness. Ernest Holmes said that it's, it's not appropriate to really say that there is no evil because certain things happen that seem awfully evil, but he says that we do not have to give undue power to evil. We don't have to empower it with our resistance or with our fear. We can, we can work with evil in, in, a, in a different way. And the way that we eradicate evil, the way that we address evil is just like opening that door and letting the light come in. We Remove evil by allowing the good to flood its presence into the, into the perception of evil. And then we amplify it, and we amplify it again, and we amplify it again. You get that? It's a little, okay, good. <laughs> Hugh gets it. Anybody else? <laughs> Maybe you could explain it, because I have no talk today. Right? <laughs> uh, I have a talk. It's just going a little differently than I thought it would, but that's okay. That's all right. So. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, is that we often will ask ourselves, how did, how did we get so, so involved in this language of discouragement? I mean, is it, is it just me, or do you carry people around you, little voices in your head, that are telling you what's wrong with you, and how this thing is not really going to work, and they're telling you, you know, this is really not a good idea, you probably shouldn't try this, right? Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> All right. I heard a no over there. We'll, we'll talk after church. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think it's, it's just something that we've learned, and we've learned that, that it's real, and we've learned that it's true. We've learned that the negative voice is, in our head is true. I mean, do you, you get that, right? You get that, that there is this voice in our head, and we hear it, and we say, well, it's in my head, so it must be true. It's not true, or it might be, but it doesn't have to be. It is as true as you will make it. <laughs> Who's giggling in church? <laughs> That's so funny. That's like me and my sisters, my whole growing up. It's as true as you make it. It's as true as much power you, you tend to give it. And we, we tend to, we give things power by, say, by naming it as true. So if we're going around saying, you know, my, my yard looks like the Clampets, and whatever that means to Jennifer, it must mean something about you, right? What does it mean about you if your yard looks like a Clampet? You're a slob, okay. So we go around saying, I am a slob, right? I am a slob is the subtext of my yard, looks like the clampets. And, and we start gathering evidence to prove that we are a slob, when maybe we're not a slob, or maybe it's fine to be a slob, right? I'm a slob, anybody here a slob? <laughs> okay. I have, I have hay and rabbit poo in my living room, <laughs> please. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there's all of that learned behavior, all of that learned culture going on, because the whole world is in collusion to allow this to happen with us, right? The, the world supports us in this, in this collusion of creating this culture of not encouragement, but discouragement. You know, when I say culture, I mean the environment, but it's also, I think of it, because I have a, a medical background, I think of a culture as like a, a petri dish, right? With something nasty growing in it, some oozing, pustulant thing growing in it. And that's what discouragement is. It is something unpleasant growing within us that has the power to stop us, but it doesn't really have the power to stop us. We give it the power to stop us. So you're probably wondering, you're probably all too familiar with this culture of discouragement, this inner petri dish of discouragement that you may have growing within you. What do you do about it? What do you do about it? All right, so this is another thing that we did in Utah. As, as a follow-up to the exercise I just did where Jennifer and I talked about our flaws. Jennifer's gonna come up again 
And Jennifer, why don't you go first this time? And she's going to talk about something in her life that may or may not be accomplished, but she's going to talk about it like it's a done deal. <laughs> I'm starting ministerial school in January. <gasps> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So Jennifer, that is so great because I c I can see into the into your future, and I know that that is a beautiful, beautiful thing for you. That you are a wonderful minister, and you know what you do as a minister? You you open your heart, and you your open heart changes so many lives, and it makes the world better for so many people. I am so proud of you, Jennifer. That is so wonderful. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> And I would say, hmm. I have a church that is a great center of kindness, and we do a lot of great work in the world, globally. Globally. Yes, globally. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. I, I know that you are such an inspiration to everybody in that church, and I know that, that everything that you're accomplishing in that church is going out into the world globally, and it is just beautiful, and I know that we feel it wherever we are on this planet. <gasps> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. So did, did you feel yourself come alive a bit as she was saying that to me and as I was saying that to her? So why is it, I mean, that wasn't hard, was it? It wasn't hard to say that to me, was it? Was it? No, it's not hard to say nice things to you. Right. It wasn't hard for me to say nice things to Jennifer. So, so what's, what's wrong with saying nice things to ourselves from time to time, right? All the time. If we have an idea, talk about how it can be versus not how it can't be, right? And the thing is, is that, you know, really there's only one of us here. So if I'm encouraging someone over there or someone over there or someone back there, if I'm encouraging anybody here in this room or anybody, any place, I am actually really encouraging myself because there's only one of us. It's like that, that uh, reading that Hugh did from Ajahn Brahm, the Buddhist monk Ajahn Brahm, where the way, that we, the way that we treat people is the way that they treat us but also the way that we treat people is the way that we treat ourselves, and the way that we treat ourselves is the way that we treat other people. So if you can be enthusiastic, enthusiastic, if you can be encouraging about yourself, about your hopes and your dreams, about everything that you want to do, everything that you want to be, if you can be enthusiastic about all of that, that is a blessing to the world because the world needs enthusiastic people who are on fire with the love of God, who are a blessed presence of encouragement to all beings everywhere. Yes. Yes, the world needs that from you, from all of us. The world needs it. And you know why the world needs it? Because it's true. <laughs> you were going to say something else, right? <laughs> Don't say it, it's okay. The world needs it because it is true. It is true. The world needs to align itself with truth because truth is what eradicates fear. Truth is what eradicates lying. Truth is what diminishes the terror that we might feel. Truth is what lifts us up into the center of love because love is the only real thing. The angels are, are speaking. I love it when the angels speak to me. <laughs> That's okay. All right. You may be wondering about how to apply this in your own life, how to move into this place where you are graciously and humbly encouraging yourself. Because, you know, actually to put down the creation of spirit, which is you and your highest aspirations, is, is an arrogant act. But to encourage yourself is to allow spirit to shine and allow spirit to grow. So it's truly a, hum a humbling act and a humble act. How do you do it? Well, as I mentioned before, the first thing is to make it conscious, to notice what you're doing. You know, I'm, I'm, we're so used to the, the scripts that we have in our head, to the signs that we have hanging around our necks, and we think they're real, and we think that's because we're saying them, they must be real, and it's so familiar, that, so that also makes it real, and most of the world is saying it too, so that makes it real, right? We're so familiar with all of that, that part of, part of our, our job is to actually examine the sign that we have our, around our neck, to examine the script that we have in our head, and then begin to embrace it and transcend it. So this week when I was walking around saying, you know, I, I don't have any talks, I've been doing this for a long time, I'm all done, all the ideas are used up, all of that stuff to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, is that really true? And it's not true. And can I say something else instead? Well, God will provide you with enough ideas. Well, God will step in. You allow spirit to work through you and that'll make it, that, that'll make it better. Allow spirit to, to to inform you and to give you a download like spirit always does and to, and to just flow and, and just leave the stress part aside. Leave, leave the worry aside. You don't really need that anymore. And you know, 
it's a, it's a powerful thing to do. It feels like lying at first. It feels like you're making something up. But you're making up the other stuff, too, right? <laughs> so if you're going to tell a story, tell a really good story. Tell a really good story. Move off of the dog shaming website and go into the people celebrating website, right? People celebrating, I am a divine child of God. I am a presence of enthusiasm. I am love. I am light. I am power. I am joy. I am gleeful. I am delighted with my life. Say that after me. I am delighted with my life. I am delighted with my life. Yes. <laughs> and if you wiggle your hips when you say it, it helps it get in there. <laughs> I am delighted with my life. Whatever. Okay. So, so. <laughs> That's one way to do it. That's one way to transform yourself from the inside out. But as I mentioned before, that there is only one of us here, and its name is spirit, and its name is love. There's only one of us here. So part of our rehabilitation in terms of moving from discouragement to encouragement is to be encouraging to other people, to encourage other people as well. One of the favorite, my favorite things that I've done in the center was uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago when I, we were talking about the kindness ministry and we talked about how um, it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing to go up to strangers, like in a, in a grocery store at Starbucks or what have you, and say to them, is there anything I can do to help you have a great day? And how much resistance there is to that, first of all. How much resistance is it, there is because there's going to be something that they're going to ask and you won't be able to provide it and then you'll feel like a big loser, right? <laughs> My experience, and I've talked to others who have done that as well, is that it's quite the opposite, that life feels like a party, and that really what people want most of all is to be seen and to be heard, to be asked, and to be encouraged. I had a, a young man in a, at a um, Starbucks, I believe it was, that said that he was studying to be an EMT, and he just wanted someone to tell him he could do it. And so I did. One of our congregants, um, who she, I gave, she gave me permission to tell this story, and she may remain nameless, but she may look a lot like the choir director, Mary Kerrigan. Um, <laughs> she also tried this in Starbucks. Starbucks is a great place. You know, and she said that when she went in there, the, the, the barista was friendly already, that she was perfectly pleasant and perfectly friendly. But Mary asked the question, is there anything I can do with you or for you that will help you have an even better day? And the woman said, yeah, I want a man. <laughs> and I don't ask for much, I just want him to have teeth. <laughs> So Mary pulled it out of her hip pocket, no, <laughs> no. Pulled some dentures, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, so Mary, what Mary's response was so beautiful. She said, well, I will, I will hold that in prayer for you. I will hold that in prayer for you. I will know that possibility for you. I will know that reality for you. And really, you know, because of what we teach here is that she can probably have more than a man with teeth. She can have love. She can have love, and because everybody has access to love. Love is omnipresent. Love is, love is a, a, a beautiful, amazing thing that is always available to us. But like the, the light spilling into the darkness, we need to open the door to love. So that small interchange that Mary had with the woman at Starbucks, with the barista, started to crack open that door so love could shine into the darkness, so that light could shine into the darkness, and that that woman would experience more love. And Mary said that as she left the Starbucks, the woman was no longer being sort of the, the studiously polite Starbucks employee. She was beaming from ear to ear because she had been seen, because she had been heard, because she had been loved, and because she had been cracked open to a greater possibility by the encouraging words of one of our divine practitioners. Yay. Yay, amen. Yay and hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> The possibilities for being a powerful presence for encouragement are endless. There's one other story that shows how this can have a global impact. And really, all of the stories that I'm telling, whether it's a sermon or whether it's being nice to people in Starbucks and encouraging them, or encouraging your kids, or encouraging your, your family members or your workplaces, even encouraging people that are giving you a hard time, seeing the face of love in them as well, and encouraging and drawing out that face of love within them. All of these have a global impact. But the one that I'm going to tell you about has a literal global impact. And it started when this woman named Hannah was sitting outside of a railway station, and she was incredibly depressed and feeling badly about herself and her life. And she looked over, and she saw a homeless woman wearing, she said, these sort of army work boots that were unlaced. And the woman looked bedraggled and forlorn, and like she was in need of encouragement. 
And Hannah, rather than going over to her, decided to write her a love letter, a letter of encouragement. And she, she got engrossed in it, and she wrote it for about 20 minutes, and then by the time she looked up, the woman had left already. But she left the letter for somebody else to read. And on the outside of the letter, it said, if you are reading this, it is for you. And that morphed into a global organization where Hannah started, I think she posted on Facebook, and she said, you know, if you need a love letter, I will write one for you. And she wrote over 400 letters for people who said they needed a love letter. And then she developed a website, and she started getting people to volunteer as writers, and also they could request letters for other people, and they could request letters for themselves, or they could just do anonymous letters sort of all over the place. And as, as of now, she has, they have written, they have distributed more than a quarter of a million letters of encouragement, of encouragement. So when I send out the newsletter this week, I'm going to put the, web, the, the link to that if you want to be part of that, and also the link to some of the other things we've talked about. But really, you see how simple it is. You see how simple it is. So the thing is, is to do it, to motivate ourselves to do it, to recognize that when we encourage ourselves, when we encourage others, we align with a truth, with a power, with a presence that is greater than anything that we can possibly imagine, that it pours through us and blesses the world, and those blessings ripple back to us and, and allow us to celebrate even more and pour even more deeply into the world. This is a magnificent universe that we are living in, folks. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. We are part of it. It is great. It is grace. It is love. And all we need to do, all we need to do is to open that door. And we open the door through the quality of our thoughts, through the quality of our consciousness, through our willingness to say, I am a powerful presence for encouragement. Say that after me now. I am a powerful presence for encouragement. And so it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How wonderful it is just to sit and be still and know the powerful truth, the goodness of the life of love that lives and moves and has its perfect being through each of us. And how beautiful it is to sit together in community and raise each other up in this consciousness, to know this truth that frees us, that frees us from fear and that frees us from darkness. How beautiful it is to shine the light of this consciousness through the opening of our hearts and minds and our beings, through our service, through our willingness, through our joy. And so I unify with this powerful presence. I open the door. I step into the light. I step into the goodness, and I know that it is who I am. And as I speak in the first person, I am speaking for the universal I am, for all of us. I know that we are collectively and individually that perfect life of love that longs to express, that longs to encourage, that perfect life of beauty that is seeking a greater depth and meaning in life. And so today we say yes to that. We say yes to depth. We say yes to meaning. We say yes to power. We say yes to presence. We say yes to love. We say yes to becoming that encouraging presence. We encourage ourselves. We encourage others. We live in the place of heartfulness. We live in the place of in courage, in heart. And we allow that courage to be our guide, our encouragement, our bliss, our passion, and our power. I'm so grateful, so grateful to be able to participate in a world where encouragement is not only possible, it is the right thing to do. I'm so grateful to celebrate this with everyone here this morning and so grateful in joyful anticipation, knowing that the ripples of encouragement have already started transforming us from the inside out and that our lives expand into beauty and love and grace and goodness. It's all here for us. We open the door and allow it in. And so, with gratitude, I bless this teaching. I bless this center and everyone in it. I bless all paths to God, churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, I bless fundamentalists and atheists. I bless all beings, for all beings are a blessing. And with a heart that is overflowing with blessings, I say, thank you, Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you, encouraging presence. And I release these words into the divine mystery. And together we say, and so it is. <clears throat> I am so blessed.
didn't turn out like you planned and you feel left behind note the tightening of your grip and the closing of your mind i can only hope you'll dance regardless of the circumstance the sand will shift the tide will turn hold fast to who you are be happy anyway be happy anyway the good and bad in life will come to pass for they do not come to stay be happy anyway be happy anyway staring at the same old wall will surely drive you up it and you will not prevail telling the same tale so just drop it it's time to plant a hopeful seed and turn away from the choking need to stare at what's not wanted there's a new picture out there be happy anyway be happy the good and bad in life will come to pass for they do not come to stay be happy anyway be happy anyway maybe you have the right to sing the blues oh but you also have a mind that's free to choose the headlines they are changing and the clouds are gonna clear so start speaking what you're dreaming of instead of what you fear be happy anyway be happy anyway there is so much there to share within you. Come on then, right now, I dare you. Be happy anyway. Be happy anyway. The good and bad in life will come to pass, for they do not come.